The film begins with a guy named Mike McCluskey. He's a businessman who does some interesting business stuff at a prison in Kingston. One day, he tells a kid to hit a tennis ball into the prison yard. But the tennis ball lands right in the middle of the yard, but there's this prison guy named Ed who just lets it go by. But suddenly, the ball gets picked up by one of the prisoners, and inside the tennis ball, there's actually a secret package. Turns out they use tennis balls to sneak in stuff that's not allowed, and the prison guards don't even notice. And it's not just this prison cause there are seven other prisons nearby, all within 10 miles. There are like 20,000 inmates in total, and they could all be potential customers for Mike. He's like the go-between for these prisoners and the outside world. Two days back, there was this guy named Mitch McCluskey, who happens to be Mike's older brother. Right now, Mitch is the mayor of Kingston. Not long after that, another man named Walter came to ask Mitch for some help. You see, Walter's daughter got into trouble for using drugs and ended up in jail. Walter paid Mitch and then asked him to move his daughter to a different prison. But Walter's daughter had a fight with some other inmates, including hitting a guard. So she got transferred to Hedsec prison. At that time, Mitch thought that Hedsec was the right place for Walter's daughter, but Walter disagreed. Then Mitch gave Walter a suggestion though. He told Walter to tell his daughter to act like she might harm herself with a piece of cloth, like she's going to hurt herself. If she does that, the guards will move her to a special cell where she'll be safe from other prisoners. After a while, Mitch's secretary, Rebecca, let him know that there were more visitors waiting to meet him. One of them was a lady named Vera, who said she's Milo's wife from the center. She mentioned that Milo is counting down the days until he's either set free or something worse happens. She went on to explain that Milo asked Mitch for a favor. He wants Mitch to help him with the bag that Vera will be taking to Estonia tomorrow. To sweeten the deal, Vera offered Mitch $10,000 for his assistance. She handed over a map of the bag's location and asked him to make a copy while she kept the original map. Meanwhile, outside Mitch's office, there were some guys with tattoos named Ramos waiting to meet the mayor. They seemed to take an interest in Vera, who looked attractive. On the other hand, Mike was talking to two officers named Ed and Gim. At that time, Jim told Mike that his nephew, Sam, who had just gotten out of prison, got into a fight with a black inmate named Daryl. Worse yet, Daryl sent a letter to the government that could cause trouble for Sam. Meanwhile, at Hedsec Women's Prison, there was a lady named Miriam working as a supplier for the female prisoners. After her shift, a prisoner asked Miriam for help with her niece's situation, but Miriam brushed off the conversation, not being a fan of her son's dealings. Later on, Mitch and Mike caught up on the beach to talk about Milo's request and Sam's issues. They were worried about the letter from the black prisoners, which could lead to bigger problems. They also met a big shot black gang leader named Bunny. Even though Bunny had an important role among the black community in Kingston, he had a quirky personality that Mitch and Mike liked. They hoped to team up with him. Bunny told his crew to get drinks for Mike and Mitch. They met with Bunny because he had a letter from Daryl. They planned to get the letter to help Sam. However, Bunny didn't want to give the letter for free. They struck a deal to trade it for a bag of drugs. Turns out, part of Mike's and Mitch's job was to smooth things over with the prisoners and guards, even though they were no longer behind bars themselves. Meanwhile, in the prison, there's this guy, Daryl, who's giving Sam, the new guard, a hard time. There, Daryl is asking Sam for $500 worth of cigarettes and drugs. He's saying that if Sam refuses, then something bad is going to happen involving the district attorney and a letter tomorrow. But Sam isn't scared of Daryl's threats. He stands up to him and even ends up getting into a fight with him, causing a commotion in Daryl's cell. Now, let's switch scenes. We're with Mitch and Mike's younger brother, Kyle McCluskey. Kyle is a cop, and he's got a wife named Tracy. When he gets to the police station, he finds his fellow detectives laughing at some of Mitch's crazy stories. At that time, Mitch asks Kyle to join Mike in collecting Milo's stuff because it's located out of town. With a map copy from Vera, they venture into a forest to find a bag holding $200,000. Meanwhile, at a nightclub, Ramos crosses paths with Vera, who's an exotic dancer. He hires her to dance at his table. Back in the prison, Sam is getting treated for his injuries. He admits that Daryl had intimidated him, 
when he tried to get him into his cell. Sam also shares that he fought back when Daryl attacked him first. Hearing this, the head warden decides to move Sam to a different post at the tower to keep him safe. On the other hand, something really unexpected was happening. Vera was leaving the club, and without her knowing, Ramos followed her secretly. The surprise continued when he ended up in Vera's house and caught her off guard when she was about to sleep. At that time, she got startled and tried to shoot Ramos, but he managed to dodge her and instead did something terrible to her. In a weird twist, Ramos found a treasure map that belonged to Vera. He also thought the mayor had the money. Little did he know, Mike had actually kept the money safe in Mitch's office. The next morning, Mitch went to his office and found Ramos already inside, pointing a gun at him, demanding the money. At that time, Mitch had no choice but to give in, and sadly, Ramos shot him right there. At the same time, Mike talked to Bunny, who was emotional because Sam had killed Daryl in prison. Mike had no idea about this and was taken aback when Bunny attempted to attack him. Mike was in for another shock when he reached Mitch's office. There were police everywhere. The chief of police, Ian, tried to call Mike down outside, but he insisted on going in. At that moment, Mike also learned that Vera had been found dead after a horrible incident at her house the previous night. Then, Ian explained that they had found the fingerprints of the person responsible. The sight of Mitch's lifeless body in front of the safe hit Mike hard. Even Kyle, who was Mike's brother and a police officer, felt the same sadness. None of them expected Mitch to pass away so suddenly. Kyle mentioned that this kind of thing might have been more fitting for Mike, who was involved in shady dealings. Meanwhile, Miriam, who had been teaching prisoners, got the sad news as well. After a while, Mike went to where Ramos' house was, and he found that the place was surrounded by a SWAT team. He talked to Ian and suggested that it would be better if Ramos didn't get caught alive and end up in jail. Soon after, the SWAT team entered the house, and when they woke Ramos up, he got startled. They told Ramos to grab his gun slowly, but instead, he pointed it at the SWAT team. In response, they shot and killed him. At the same time, things went as Mike planned with the ambush. The police were getting closer to Mike and Mitch, and they used this situation to their advantage. Still in shock from Mitch's death, Mike decided to head to a bar to clear his head. It wasn't long before Milo showed up, accompanied by another man named Yosep. Turned out, they were looking for Milo's money, but Mike informed them that the police had the money now, and he couldn't do anything about it. Then, Yosep threatened Mike, but Mike fought back and even warned Yosep that he wouldn't hesitate to harm Milo, even though Milo was behind bars, if Yosep kept blaming him for what happened. To calm himself, Mike went to his private cabin in the middle of a forest far from the city. There was no phone signal in that area. While he was sitting there, a bear suddenly appeared, probably looking for food. The following day, Mike went back to his mom's place. She wasn't happy with him because he was still involved in the family's not-so-clean business, which his dad had passed down. But Mike argued that the business isn't breaking the law and actually helps keep the peace, especially when it comes to dealing with racism. Later, Mike returned to Mitch's office and took some money from the safe. He also had a gun he took from the men Bunny had sent after him the other day. On his way home, a woman approached Mike seeking help for her son who's in prison. At that time, Mike was hesitant at first, even though he's now the mayor after taking over from Mitch. Eventually, he agreed to help and even asked for the woman's daughter's name. The next day was Mitch's funeral. Mike had just left the gravesite as rain started to fall. Everyone gathered at Mitch's house. There, people shared funny stories about Mitch, and even Kyle managed to smile hearing those tales. Ed, too, looked really sad as he'd known Mitch since they were kids. Mike and Ed then had a talk about the ongoing conflict between different gangs and racial groups in the prison. They brainstormed ideas on how to solve the problem. In the evening, Mike went to Mitch's office and deliberately set fire to the carpet where Mitch had died. Soon after, the fire alarm went off, and not long after that the firefighters and police arrived. When questioned, Mike admitted that he did it on purpose, as a way of remembering Mitch whenever he looked at the safe. Now, as the mayor of Kingston, Mike took on his role and offered social assistance to people with family members in jail. 
However, there was a situation he couldn't help with a woman whose sister faced the death penalty for a terrible crime of randomly shooting people at a bus stop. Shortly after that, Bunny called Mike to offer his condolences for Mitch's death. Despite the personal relationship, Bunny was disappointed in their business dealings and got angry with Mike. In response, Mike retrieved a gun he kept in the safe, went to Bunny's house, and made a destructive entrance. He damaged Bunny's fence and even tossed a grenade. This kind of intense action wasn't new for them, as they were used to clashes. Interestingly, someone was always keeping an eye on Mike's activities. Later on, Mike went to a weapon shop to get advice on dealing with a bear. He wanted to know what the bear liked to eat and what weapons would work to immobilize it. Soon after, he ended up buying a bow and arrow along with a teddy bear. He also purchased some raw potatoes and cooking oil. When he got back to his cabin, he set up the potatoes in oil where he'd seen the bear before. Unfortunately, after a long wait, the bear didn't show up. Instead, another animal approached, seemingly interested in the potato bait Mike had prepared. The next day, two FBI agents showed up at Mike's office. They wanted to talk to Mike about Mitch and Vera, and also about Mitch's death and its connection to Milo. They explained that Milo was involved in a robbery where he killed two guards during an armored car heist. They also revealed that Mitch had been an FBI informant, getting paid $2,500 a month for it. What surprised Mike was that they even knew about him throwing a grenade at Bunny, the drug dealer boss, just yesterday. Without hesitation, Mike agreed to be an informant for the FBI, just like Mitch had been. And right away, he received a check for his first month's payment. Later on, Ian and his team asked Mike to help catch a criminal. They guided him over the radio, telling him to keep moving as their target was nearby. Eventually, Mike's car crashed into the criminal's car. On a different note, Yosef visited the prison to meet his boss, Milo. There, Yosef admitted he couldn't pressure Mike aggressively like he'd been instructed. Hearing this, Milo ordered Yosef to contact Iris, who was currently in New York. On a different note, the lady who had visited Mike the previous day came back. She was concerned because her brother was facing execution. Sadly, Mike told her that there was no way to change the sentence. She also asked Mike to be there when the execution happened. Meanwhile, Yosep got in touch with Iris, who turned out to be a young and attractive woman. Yosep instructed Iris to head to Kingston for a task given by Milo. A bit later, the day of the execution arrived. The victim's family, Mike, and the suspect's family gathered to witness the execution. The rules were clear no shouting or interfering, or they'd risk six months in jail. The suspect was seated, awaiting execution through lethal injection. The prison head offered the defendant a chance to say his final words. They also had a priest say a prayer for the suspect. Eventually, a liquid was injected into his body, and within moments, he passed away. After getting back from the prison, Mike took some time to buy a chair for Bunny. Bunny appeared pleased by Mike's gesture, despite their past conflicts. Mike then shared that the executed person had been responsible for shooting a young girl. The two of them casually chatted while enjoying drinks. After a while, there's a drug dealer named Kenny who's busy making drugs in his camper van. Inside the van, there's a boy and his mom too. Kenny realizes he's out of drinks, so he decides to go buy some. In his rush, he forgets to put out his cigarette, leading to a fire and an explosion. Later on, the police show up at the scene, and Mike arrives after being called by Kyle. They figure out that the camper van belongs to Kenny. However, the shocking discovery is the charred body of a boy. Soon, the chief of police arrives and gives them three weeks to solve the case. If they can't, another team will take over. Surprisingly, it turns out that the boy isn't Kenny's son. Following that, Mike and Ian plan to take down Kenny, as he would just enjoy TV in jail. They discuss their plan with Kyle, as their actions often go beyond orders and procedures. Despite being the mayor and an FBI informant, Mike agrees to their plan. A bit later, Ian and his team cornered Kenny's friend, leading to the arrest of a guy named Spike. They pressured Spike to spill the beans on Kenny's whereabouts. However, he was more keen on talking to Kyle. Meanwhile, Mike had a meeting with one of the gang leaders, Duke. At that time, Duke mentioned that Mike could deal with Kenny, as he wasn't part of their gang. In fact, 
Duke preferred Kenny to be taken down right then and there if they found him. As a respected gang leader, Mike asked Duke for information on Kenny's whereabouts, in case Kenny sought refuge with Duke. On the other hand, Kenny was in a remote location, full of regret for his reckless actions. The next morning, Rebecca brought Mike a cup of coffee as she found him still sleeping on the couch. Soon Mike's first guest, Carlos, arrived. There, Carlos shared that his nephew had been fatally shot by a SWAT team last week, and the person responsible was none other than Ramos. Hearing this, Mike got worried that Carlos might seek revenge, so he quickly grabbed the gun from under his desk. Surprisingly, Carlos agreed with Mike's cautious approach. Carlos had come to talk about Kenny, who had apparently caused an explosion that took the lives of his wife and son. Then, Carlos had a proposition to share. He had a plan involving giving money to Kenny. If Kenny showed up, he would inform Mike about it, but Carlos wanted this kept secret from others. Hearing that, Mike agreed to Carlos' proposal. Before leaving, Carlos mentioned he recognized Mike from somewhere. Although it wasn't clear what he meant, Mike replied that it was a long time ago. Elsewhere, Miriam noticed Tracy panting and clutching her stomach, hinting at a possible pregnancy. Despite Miriam's curiosity, Tracy didn't reveal anything. The two of them then decided to organize a family dinner. On another front, the Kingston police were gathering to discuss their strategy after apprehending Kenny. The first option was to put Kenny in protective custody. The second option was to release him on parole, setting a trap to catch him violating it and sending him back to jail. Their motive was to use guys like Kenny for their own purposes. Shortly after, Ed arrived, expressing his belief that criminals who harm children like Kenny should meet swift justice once in prison. A bit later, Ian and his team assembled at a harbor. However, Kyle ended up in a brawl with a fellow officer. Seeing this, Andy, the head of the SWAT team, intervened to break them up. Andy was annoyed by Kyle's behavior leading him to assign Jimmy to lead the operation instead of Kyle. In the meantime, Mike paid a visit to Bunny, bringing along Bunny's favorite bread. During their chat, they talked about the police and their actions, which often deviated from legal procedures. Soon after, Bunny explained that when Kenny ended up in prison, numerous gang members there would immediately target him. Then Mike shared that his and Mitch's efforts aimed to maintain peace in Kingston for the better. Suddenly, Bunny offered some advice, mentioning that Mike couldn't fix every issue. Sometimes, it's better to let go and start anew. Bunny also let Mike know that his crew was ready to handle Kenny, in case Mike didn't want to. Meanwhile, the SWAT team and a group of police officers stormed a house being used as a drug dealer's base. However, a criminal inside the room opened fire, leading to the unfortunate death of a police officer. Eventually, the criminals were eliminated by the SWAT team. Later in the evening, Mike returned to his office and spotted Kenny in hiding. There, he confessed that he was told to meet Mike for safety. Despite this, Mike struck Kenny with a key. Then, Kenny emphasized his regret for his foolish actions. Shortly after, Mike instructed Kenny to surrender to the police, who would place him in protective custody until his trial. Kenny had to plead guilty without any appeal. He also had to serve his prison sentence diligently until his death. Mike also hoped Kenny would have a chance at a longer life. In the meantime, Miriam and Tracy had been waiting a while for Kyle and Mike to join them for dinner. At that time, Kyle was feeling down after Jimmy's death. When he finally got home, he seemed tired and dispirited, despite Tracy wanting to share the good news of her pregnancy. Ultimately, Kenny showed up at the police station to surrender himself. However, Mike was furious because it seemed the police hadn't provided protection for Kenny, even though Mike had convinced Kenny to turn himself in. On the other hand, Kenny was taken directly to prison instead of a safe house for suspects. Upon entering the prison, other inmates immediately attacked and fatally stabbed him. The following day, his body was swiftly buried, with no rituals or family members present. Only Mike attended, carrying his sense of guilt alone. Later on, Milo was seen brewing coffee while studying some paper scraps on the wall of his prison cell. The purpose of the writing and his plans were still undisclosed. On another note, Mike caught up with his mom after she finished teaching history. He apologized for missing dinner. 
Miriam responded by slapping Mike and revealing that Tracy was pregnant, which meant Kyle would become a father. She voiced her concern about not wanting Tracy to end up a widow due to Kyle's involvement in Mike's criminal activities. Then, as Mike was getting ready to head to the office, Bunny gave him a call, saying he had something important to discuss face to face. There Mike insisted on talking right then, mentioning that an FBI van was parked close to Bunny's place, watching his every move. Despite this, Bunny persisted, so Mike decided to visit Bunny at his house. When Mike arrived, Bunny had his men play loud music from their cars to prevent the FBI from eavesdropping on their conversation. Bunny then explained that the inmates were requesting drugs since they had taken care of Kenny. Hearing that, Mike declined, explaining he couldn't do that. He stressed that the only concessions he could offer were more time in the prison yard and access to the TV in the dining room. There would also be leniency in certain regulations and mail wouldn't be scrutinized, including letters from female visitors. On another note, Rebecca informed Iris to come over the next day as Mike was occupied outside the office. Then, after his meeting with Bunny, Mike headed to Duke's headquarters and shattered a glass. At that time, Mike was upset because Duke's imprisoned members should have prevented Kenny's fate. Adding to that, they demanded drugs in return, which further irritated Mike. The prisoners, mainly Duke's gang members, even threatened to start a riot if their demands weren't met. At that time, Mike made it clear that he could only relax certain rules. He also reminded Duke that there were more guards than his members in the prison. In the evening, Mike was relaxing in his cabin, now accompanied by a bear. He noticed a car approaching and decided to hide to see who it was. Surprisingly, it was Kyle. Kyle shared that the police offered him a promotion to the Southwest Narcotics Division near the Green Rapid border, extending up to Muskegat, specifically the port of Benton. With the promotion, Kyle's salary would be a hefty $70,000. Although the pay was good, Mike warned him about the organized and clever criminals in that area. He reminded Kyle of Jimmy's death, showing the strength of the drug distribution organization from Canada. Those criminals are professionals. The next day, Mike enjoyed his coffee and cigarette in his office. Then he reached out to Ed, wanting to discuss something privately. In their meeting, Mike mentioned the pressure he was under from different parties seeking compensation for Kenny's death. They were demanding money and drugs, which Mike couldn't provide. He was also certain the Mexicans in prison would make similar demands. Mike then discussed with Ed about giving a warning to the top gang leaders in the prison. There, Ed suggested involving Ian to hand over the psychopath to the SWAT team. However, Mike disagreed as he wanted to keep the psychopath for a later plan. Now, the identity of the psychopath was still unknown. Back in prison, Ed took action to teach the black gang leaders a lesson. He announced the withdrawal of facilities and privileges because they had asked for more. The gang leader was punished with solitary confinement. Meanwhile, Mike visited the police headquarters to seek Ian's help in identifying Carlos, the gangster controlling Locos. Soon after, he informed Ian that Carlos had been convicted of killing someone three times and received only an additional three years. Then, Ian shared that Carlos had a skilled lawyer, and after contacting his relatives, they pinpointed Carlos' location at a dog farm. Shortly after, Mike requested Ian to arrest Carlos with a warrant as he would play a role in the upcoming plan. On another note, it seems Miriam was preparing to provide materials at the prison when a fight broke out among the female inmates. Luckily, Miriam was quickly secured in the classroom, and the officers managed to quell the riot. When he got back to the office, Mike finally encountered Iris, who appeared very attractive. She then confessed that she was sent by Milo to deliver a message that Mike shouldn't be angry with him anymore. She even suggested being intimate with Mike as a gesture. Unfortunately, Mike wasn't the type to engage in such affairs. He made it clear that sending a woman to seduce him was pointless. Mike also mentioned that there's only a year left to endure in this crime-filled environment. Hearing that, Iris seemed surprised as it was the first time someone had turned her down. Mike then instructed her to inform Milo that they had a good time, even though they actually didn't. In the evening, Mike headed to Carlos' place where he encountered a guard who wasn't willing to provide answers. He then used his gun to persuade the guard. Surprisingly, the police had already apprehended Carlos under a warrant. 
Soon after, Mike contacted Ian and learned that Carlos had been arrested for failing to pay child support amounting to just $3,700. Then, he instructed Ian to get in touch with Kyle, who was busy ordering pizza and watching someone who appeared lost. At that time, Kyle noticed an alternate entry through the back door, and Ian was directed to approach from that direction to assist Hun. Meanwhile, Carlos was released from the holding cell due to someone bailing him out. Unbeknownst to Kyle, Mike was the one who arranged the bail, strategically putting Carlos in his debt. Mike's intention was to leverage this favor to make sure Carlos controlled his prison members and didn't stir up trouble like Bunny and Duke. Carlos also mentioned recognizing Mike from their encounters in the prison yard. At the same time, the tattoo-covered tavern owner eyed Kyle suspiciously. At that moment, Ian sneaked in, brandishing his gun at the drug addict. However, a gunshot came from the tavern owner, and Kyle and Ian retaliated by shooting him. After a while, Mike reached the location where Ian and Kyle were. However, a police officer who didn't recognize him halted Mike as he was about to enter. Then, Mike saw assistance from his colleague named Stevie to gain entry. He then inquired with a restaurant waiter about what transpired inside. The waiter recounted that their boss shot two policemen, and in response, Ian and Kyle took down their boss. Meanwhile, Kyle and Ian faced criticism from a police supervisor named Tom for their actions. To ensure the legality of their actions, Mike intervened and stepped in to defend Kyle and Ian. He also had a conversation with Evelyn, a district attorney, and Mike's date for the evening. At that time, Evelyn clarified that the addict within the restaurant was also shot by Ian. The issue arose as the addict had only possessed a knife, a sharp pipe, and a $2 bill. Tom then admitted to Mike that he was orchestrating a cover-up for Ian and Kyle's actions. Soon after, Mike proposed to Tom to frame the incident as a drug dealer raid, suggesting that they present an alibi portraying the restaurant owner as a drug dealer and the addict as a customer. Tom indicated that he would agree if drugs were discovered on the victim. Shortly after, Mike entered the place to examine the victim's body and shared his thoughts with Stevie and Evelyn. Eventually, she agreed with the plan. Then, as a token of appreciation, Mike also invited Evelyn out for a date. Meanwhile, in the prison, Mike observed an officer named Ernie, who often faced teasing from colleagues due to his habit of working overtime and eating prison food. His peers suggested that the prison was a more suitable home for Ernie than his actual house. Tired of the comments, he chose to leave. Later, Ed and his buddy decided to provide a special meal for Daryl, who was currently in solitary confinement. However, Daryl reacted angrily as the food served resembled dirt. The following day, Mike met with a client named Detchert. There, Detchard explained that his younger brother had received a two-year sentence for being part of a street race that led to an accident. The police apprehended the driver and all passengers, including his younger brother, due to the collision. Interestingly, his brother was an excellent student and only 16 years old. Mike then explained that in a specialized prison for children, gang members would be separated from the rest of the inmates. There are 400 children in the gangs and 80 in the general population. However, Mike knows that Detchard's younger brother is indeed a gang member, and he's at risk from his own associates. Mike also mentioned that Detchard's brother would have to make a payment upfront if he wanted to stay safe. Afterward, a man named Sho, who worked for the district attorney, met with Mike. Sho talked about his daughter's case as she was kidnapped and killed. Her body hasn't been found yet. Then, Sho shared that the suspect's name is James Parker, and he's currently on death row. Despite confessing, Parker later retracted his confession. Soon after, Sho mentioned that there might not be justice served due to the lack of a body as evidence. He understood Mike's unique influence over Kingston's prison. Sho explained that if Parker confesses to have killing someone, the trial would be reopened, causing the execution to be postponed again. His main desire is for Parker to die and end his daughter's suffering in the afterlife. However, Parker and his lawyers are clever, cause an additional confession might grant Parker another chance in court and extend the legal process by three or four years. At that time, Sho believes that Mike is a dangerous person who should be executed as soon as possible. Therefore, he seeks Mike's help, 
as Mike has connections to every inmate that private investigators or government officials lack. Although Mike declined any payment for this case, Sho still gave him a check with money. However, Mike only has two weeks before Parker's execution date. Meanwhile, Iris just arrived at a nightclub owned by Crage, who is part of Milo's crew. Yosep then instructed Iris to strip and dance on stage. At that time, Crage thought Iris would make good money, but Yosep disagreed, as Iris was meant to tempt the judge and the prosecutor, requiring a different approach. In a different context, Mike received news about how officials were treating Daryl from Bunny. Bunny was concerned that Daryl might lose control, so he asked Mike to talk to the prison staff. Following that, they discussed Detchard's younger brother, who was in a juvenile detention center and facing issues. Mike cared about the young boy since he's only 16. He also asked Bunny for assistance. Mike's strong influence in prisons comes from his rapport with local gang leaders. He inquired if any of Bunny's associates were stationed near James Parker's cell. At that moment, Bunny was surprised when he heard Parker's name. Then, Bunny mentioned that white people have a different way of surviving, not relying on gun violence like some others. However, when they do resort to killing, they can take out a large number of lives and even turn to extreme actions like cannibalism. Bunny said he'd help Mike, but he needed Mike's assistance to accompany his cousin Hakim, who had a hockey match. At first, Mike declined, but eventually agreed. During the journey, it's revealed that Mike and Bunny first met in prison. Meanwhile, the police gather to discuss the plan to arrest Carlos. Mike had previously asked Ian to handle the arrest to gain a favor from him. Since 1998, Carlos had been in and out of prison due to armed robbery and a 20-year sentence. He started in a youth facility and was transferred to mall prison at 18. Carlos had also faced charges for killing three persons. After explaining, the chief of police made a jest at Ian and Kyle, who were present too. Following the commissioner's orders, they were told to approach the target cautiously to prevent reckless gunfire. Carlos needed rearrest due to a positive drug test, as his parole had ended, leaving him with a sentence of two decades. On the other hand, Ernie has returned home, where he deals with the challenges of having a mentally disabled son and a constantly upset ex-wife. His home life is far from peaceful. Meanwhile, Mike is at a hockey game where Hakeem is playing. Eventually, another man and his friends arrive, also watching their kids play on the opposing team. Later, the police successfully apprehend Carlos without a struggle. At the same time, the hockey match heats up due to some unsportsmanlike behavior from the other team towards Hakim. On another front, Crage notices Iris engaging in conversation with club guests instead of dancing. Despite not dancing, Iris is still able to earn money through these interactions. She mentions that Mike proposed to her, and as a result, she declines the advances of her guest. At that time, Iris is smitten with Mike and openly refers to him as her future husband. At night, the officers seized many of Carlos' dogs. Meanwhile, the hockey match escalated into a brawl. At that time, he became emotional when he saw Hakim being mistreated by the man who had greeted him earlier. This led Mike to engage in a fight, and he was joined by his friends. Eventually, Mike stepped onto the field to protect Hakim. Despite their bruised faces, both of them returned home, and Mike found a sense of happiness in looking out for Hakim, whom he treated like his own son, even though Hakim is of a different race. After dropping Hakim off at home, Mike went out to dinner with Evelyn. While they were putting up a pretense of liking each other, things escalated and they ended up in bed. However, he abruptly left because Evelyn's words offended him. On another note, Carlos has been apprehended and is undergoing procedures before being placed in prison. Meanwhile, doctors are shown performing surgery on a dog's paw. Mike is then seen visiting Bunny again. At that time, Bunny chuckled when Hakim referred to Mike as a superhero. Then Mike assured Bunny that in the next match, he would bring a crowd to support their side. He also mentioned that whenever he gets angry, he thinks of Mitch. Soon after, Bunny chimed in, sharing that unfortunate destinies awaited the males in his family, leading either to death or incarceration. This sad truth extended to Hakim as well, which was unexpected. Then, Bunny mused over history's journey for black people, 
who ran to secure their freedom. Over 150 years ago, slavery ended and friendships like Mike's and Bunny's, bridging the racial divide, symbolized the end of racism's grip. The two friends are now united in their effort to bring peace to Kingston. The following day, Sam was assigned to a tower post, surveilling the yard where inmates congregated. He observed two factions forming, preparing to clash. Quick to respond, he sounded the alarm and took up his gun, while fellow officers dispersed riot-controlling water gas. Soon after, Sam fired a warning shot, but in the chaos, he ended up shooting a black inmate who was attacking. Afterward, a contingent of riot police was deployed to quell the situation. Then, the head of the prison convened a meeting with senior wardens, including Sam's uncle, Jim, to address the error. Sam was deemed unfit to remain in the men's prison due to the risk he posed as a target. Consequently, he was to be transferred to a women's prison. Furthermore, they inquired about the confinement of Bunny's gang leaders. It explained they had defied the rules, leading to their solitary confinement. The ensuing riots triggered a lockdown, causing even the electricity supply to be cut off. Infuriated, Bunny urgently called Mike to the scene. Notably, others, including Iris, reached out to Mike due to the riot and Sam's disastrous mistake. Soon after, Bunny jumped in, sharing how his friends were both stabbed by fellow inmates and shot by the officers. Additionally, his gang's three leaders were isolated. Furious and threatening violence, Bunny even mentioned killing Sam. Shortly after, his gang was gearing up for a showdown with the police and SWAT. However, Mike reminded Bunny of his role as a drug dealer under constant surveillance. Bunny's operations were monitored around the clock, and he couldn't make a move without the authorities knowing. Then Mike suggested him talk to the police instead of acting out of anger, which could harm him more than anyone else. Next, Mike paid a visit to Duke. He had learned that Duke's gang had sparked the riots that sent 50 of Bunny's men to the hospital. Duke, however, blamed Bunny's gang for breaking an agreement. He was ready for a war outside the prison against Bunny's crew. Despite Mike's threat of involving the National Guard and armored tanks, Duke held his ground. He urged Mike to press the prison officials to end the lockdown. Later that day, Mike met with Ed. He pointed out that the incident made Sam a target, both within and outside the prison walls. Then, Ed added that Sam seemed stubborn and unwilling to find common ground with the prisoners. There, Mike asked Ed to consider easing the sentence and lifting the lockdown decision. On the flip side, Iris had trouble approaching Mike gently, so Milo asked Josep to hurt her, hoping Mike would rescue her. Then, Josep ended up injuring Iris's hands badly. Later, Mike returned to his office and Rebecca greeted him. They both saw Iris entering with serious injuries on her hands and stomach. Seeing that, Mike instructed Rebecca to bring Iris to avoid any questions from the doctor that might involve the police. Mike was aware that Milo had used Iris to control the judge and congressman. He met Yosep at the bar and sought help from Ian and Kyle. There, Mike asked Ian and Kyle to show their badges before entering the bar, learning from the pizza shop incident. Inside, he sought revenge and attacked Yosep, shocking Kyle and Ian. Soon after, they left the bar and Mike went back to the office, as Iris didn't want to go home after treatment. There, she shared her painful past of being hurt by her father and abandoned by her mother at 11. She couldn't escape now either, fearing Milo's pursuit. Then Mike asked Iris for information about officials, from council members to police, involved with him to report to the FBI. Meanwhile, when Kyle got back home, Miriam scolded him for the shooting incident at the pizza shop. She also urged Kyle to distance himself from Mike, who had a criminal past due to prison time. At that time, Miriam emphasized that Kyle should consider Tracy, who is currently pregnant. The following day, three FBI agents visited Iris to gather information and showed her photos of the men she had been involved with. It turned out there were 26 men who had slept with her in various hotels, though none of them had given her money. However, Iris often received gifts like watches, jewelry, and even a Porsche car. One of the agents made a disrespectful remark and was reprimanded by his partner. Surprisingly, Iris confessed that she had been in contact with FBI leadership in New York. Soon after, Milo, who was in prison, phoned Mike and demanded he come to a park near the prison fort. 
There, he threatened to harm Iris if Mike refused. Hearing that, Mike complied and met a woman named Chandice at the location. Unexpectedly, Milo managed to video call Mike from inside the prison, indicating that he had smuggled a cell phone without authorities knowing. Then, Milo had a request for Mike, offering him a choice between Iris or Chandis in return. Mike declined, but Chandis revealed a tracking device inside him that Milo used to keep tabs on his women. Milo was a tough criminal who used attractive women to trap officials, congressmen, even the police, and FBI. Worried for Iris, Mike urgently called Rebecca to leave the office. There, Rebecca informed him that two FBI agents were still around, though the one who had bothered Iris was gone. Learning this, Mike told Rebecca to flee from his office as fast as possible. In no time, a bunch of police had surrounded Mike's office. Once he was sure it was safe, Mike headed upstairs and found two dead FBI agents, but Iris wasn't there. After a while, Sam started working in a women's prison. The inmates began teasing him, which made Miriam step in. She warned him that female prisoners can be just as dangerous as male ones and advised him to avoid making eye contact with them. Miriam also talked about the history of slavery and the deep-rooted issue of racism in the United States, dating back hundreds of years. During that talk, a female prisoner tried to catch a glimpse of Sam through her small mirror. Meanwhile, Mike teamed up with the chief of police and an FBI agent to investigate the killing of the two previous FBI agents. They uncovered that the traitor abusing Iris was a guy named Pete. For the sake of the investigation, Mike handed over his cell phone to the FBI. Outside the office, he and Kyle realized that this attack was linked to the money they had uncovered tied to Milo. Mike then asked Kyle to keep the police from monitoring him, as he didn't want to be easily traceable. Now that Mike's room was sealed, he instructed Rebecca to find a new office. He also swapped cars with her to avoid potential wiretapping. During this, he bumped into Bunny, who poked fun at his choice of driving a purple car. Bunny then called Milo a crazy criminal after hearing Mike's story. As Mike requested more time to solve the issue, he planned to return to the prison to sort things out. Accompanied by Milo's lawyer, Paul, Mike went to the prison to meet Milo. But before the meeting, he had to leave behind his valuables, like his tie, to prevent any danger. Finally, Mike got to meet Milo, who appeared calm despite Mike suspecting him of the crime. At that time, Milo's crimes were cleverly executed, leaving no direct evidence pointing to him for the killing. Milo was confident that Iris wouldn't be able to find Mike. However, Mike reminded Milo that law enforcement officers were monitoring his actions. Surprisingly, Milo revealed that they were not after him, but actually Mike. Milo then tasked Mike with finding something and the ones following Mike would understand the next steps. It turned out that Mike needed to locate a metal box. While discussing this, Mike mentioned Iris, but Milo told him to forget about her, saying she had returned to her previous job as a prostitute. At that time, Mike inquired about the 30 FBI agents tailing him, to which Milo revealed they were his men. Unexpectedly, Iris was being held captive by Yosep and a traitorous FBI agent named Pete. Pete was refraining from drinking to avoid tests on his blood and urine. The plan was for him to stage a beating to create a false situation. However, Yosep swiftly killed Pete instead. Subsequently, Iris was handed over to Duke and his gang. On a different note, Sam received advice from his higher-ups to stay focused and not fall for any attempts by female inmates to seduce him. They cautioned him that the prisoners might try various tactics to grab his attention. The experienced officers advised Sam to stick to the rulebook and not let emotions cloud his judgment. Later, as the officers were closing the cell doors one by one, they caught a detainee using a cell phone, resulting in its confiscation. Unexpectedly, a female prisoner in room A17 was seen dressed provocatively, seemingly trying to seduce Sam. Meanwhile, Kyle paid a visit to Mike at his cabin, where Mike shared Milo's demand to locate a metal object. Kyle was worried that it might be a trap set by Milo, given that FBI agents were closely monitoring Mike. However, Mike could potentially use his status as an FBI informant to share the information and gain valuable insights. Despite the challenging and uncertain path they were on, 
Mike and Kyle shared a noble intention of safeguarding the future for young people. Later on, Sho observed the execution of James Parker, the man who had kidnapped and killed his daughter. Even though there was no remorse on the killer's face, Sho felt a sense of relief knowing that Parker had met his end. This indicated that Mike had successfully played his part in ensuring James' swift execution. Meanwhile, Iris's life took a terrible turn after Milo abandoned her to Yosef's gang. While the prisoners who were supposed to be in lockdown stood against the wall, they refused the distributed food. This signaled a collective strike. Soon after, the prison warden gathered with senior staff, and Ed suggested letting them persist until they gave up. However, the warden disagreed, asserting that the prison wasn't Guantanamo Bay. At that time, the warden intended to contact the prison bureau, involving politicians. This didn't sit well with Ed, who got emotional as he disagreed. The prison head then called the gang leaders, including Carlos and Dariel, both of whom had been disciplined and sent to solitary confinement. Then, Ed warned Dariel not to cause trouble, threatening him with harm. Later on, the warden met with the four main gang leaders in the prison. There, Dariel stated that the biggest issue wasn't just hostility between prisoner gangs, but also between guard gangs. They realized the prison was like a business venture for officials. Shortly after, Dariel requested more time in the courtyard to keep the peace among prisoners and ensure proper meals. The warden inquired about the terms of this deal. Then, Dariel responded, explaining he had killed someone who had taken the life of the warden's child. Interestingly, the warden seemed unaware of a prisoner named Kenny, who had killed the warden's stepson and now was dead. Dariel simply conveyed the prisoner's request for compensation and guaranteed no more uprisings. In the end, the lockdown punishment was lifted. The next day, the cleaners in Kingston City came across a body in a garbage truck. Surprisingly, it was Pete, the FBI agent who had betrayed them. At that time, Kyle wasn't sure if Pete was linked to the case, but Mike believed that if Pete wasn't involved, he would have met the same fate as the other FBI agents. Soon after, Kyle handed over his radio to Mike, who planned to go alone in search of the metal Milo had mentioned. With the swarm of 30 FBI agents now at the scene, they wouldn't be trailing Mike. Later, Mike headed into the forest, being cautious about potential traps. Returning to his cabin, he noticed his pet bear searching for food, realizing even the mightiest creatures needed help sometimes. Th in the evening, Sam once again spotted a naked female prisoner in room 17, unaware that she secretly took a picture. The following day, Mike revisited the spot Milo had referred to, carrying a shovel and a metal detector. After scanning the area, the metal detector signaled something beneath the ground. Shortly after, Mike began digging and uncovered a rather sizable object, prompting him to call the police. Upon being unearthed, it turned out to be a school bus. There, he admitted he had no prior knowledge of it. Ian then shattered the bus's windshield and noticed a strong odor. To counter the smell, the police used cigarette filters to cover their noses as they entered the bus. Unexpectedly, they discovered 26 decomposed bodies inside. However, Mike was still unsure if Milo was the one who had caused all those deaths, or if Milo had simply learned about the location from the real psychopath. Surprisingly, the bodies were actually victims of James Parker, who had been executed not too long ago. This made Mike even more baffled about Milo's role in all of this. On top of that, Mike might also be involved, since the bus was found on his land. Evelyn urged Mike to dig into why Milo had tasked him with finding the bus's location. At the same time, Evelyn also suspected that Milo might be using Mike as a scapegoat. Taking action, Mike met with Milo's lawyer, Paul. There, Paul was taken aback by the discovery of the bodies. He informed Mike that Milo could get released on a $14 million bail, and that money was something Mike was supposed to have found on his property. But Mike couldn't comprehend that possibility, given the constant surveillance by 50 cops and potentially even satellites on his land. He mentioned that Milo could face charges of capital murder, backed by evidence of the 26 bodies and the killing of three FBI agents. Nevertheless, Mike feared he would still be entangled in the case. Shortly after, Paul explained that Milo couldn't possibly be involved because he had been in prison for nine years, making it unlikely for him to be connected to the killing. 
He noted that Milo had limited phone privileges, with only one call per week, and those calls were recorded by the police. Despite lacking proof, there was an instance where Milo had made a video call to Mike. Before leaving, Mike warned Paul that he would pursue him if he didn't want to find out what Milo had planned for him. Later, Mike met Rebecca, who showed him a new office. Surprisingly, the new office was across from his old one, so there was no escaping his problems. Soon after, Ed called Mike to brief him on the prison's current situation after the head of the prison lifted the lockdown. Ed mentioned that things seemed calm and there was no gang-related trouble. However, he suspected that the prisoners might be scheming against the officers. Then he asked Mike to gather intel on their actual plans. With this in mind, Mike promptly met with Bunny. There, Bunny claimed he hadn't received any information apart from the peaceful environment in the prison. Yet, his expression turned sinister as Mike left, hinting at something unsaid. While in his car, Mike received a call from Duke, who instructed him to come to a distant brothel. After Iris was subjected to assault by several of Duke's gang members, Duke ordered them to give Iris to another person who was interested in her. In the meantime, Sam was accompanying the female prisoner who had flirted with him to the medical room due to her stomachache. However, as they passed the stairs, she unexpectedly made advances towards Sam. On a different note, Duke sold Iris to a group of black gangsters. As they departed, Mike arrived at Duke's location, hoping to find Iris. Unfortunately, she wasn't in sight, and Duke immediately attacked Mike by strangling him. Fortunately, Mike managed to draw his gun just in time. Turns out, back when they were both in prison, they had been part of the same group and had disputes over their differing interests involving prisons. There, Duke accused Mike of being unfair in his treatment of Duke's gang members. Mike, though, reminded Duke that he had actually shielded him in the past. Meanwhile, back at the prison, the female prisoner fatally stabbed Sam multiple times. She then deceived the other officers by creating a scenario that suggested she had been sexually assaulted by Sam. While on their way with Iris, the gang that had taken her was brutally attacked by Bunny's gang. Later on, Bunny contacted Mike urgently, asking him to come over right away because a woman claiming to be associated with Mike had appeared. At that time, he seemed to know that this woman had information regarding human trafficking among fellow gangs in Kingston. When Mike arrived, he wasn't shocked to see that the woman was Iris. He finally learned that Iris had been mistreated by Duke and his gang, and then sold to another gang. Without hesitation, Mike brought Iris to Duke's headquarters. Surprisingly, Mike swiftly shot Duke in the head, killing him instantly. After that, he took down several members of Duke's gang who were present in the house. Meanwhile, the male prisoners launched a counterattack, focusing on Gim, the person responsible for feeding them in the prison. As the prisoners formed a line, they passed a knife to Daryl. Eventually, Jim was taken down after being stabbed by Daryl. At the same time, Mike guided Iris into the forest to remove the tracking device from her stomach. Following that, he led her to his cabin. During the journey, Mike opened up about his life story, explaining that he had never experienced true love. He lacked self-assurance due to his life being marred from the very beginning. As they neared his cabin, Mike's cell phone suddenly lost signal, cutting off all phone calls since there was no cellular network available. After a while, a SWAT team led by Robert prepared to ambush a house. Meanwhile, Stevie and his partner observed from a surveillance car. Even without receiving the go-ahead, Robert and his team promptly launched the attack on the gang. The following day, Mike was cooking breakfast for Iris, while Kyle faced Miriam's scolding for hurrying to work. Miriam wanted to discuss Sam's death, who was the nephew of Jim, the person stabbed by a female prisoner Miriam taught. However, Kyle explained he had a custody transfer to manage in the morning. Then Miriam advised him, who was too preoccupied with work, to make time for Tracy's obstetrician appointments. Kyle was surprised to learn that Tracy was expecting a baby boy, due to be born on February 29 in a leap year. Interestingly, Miriam suggested that Kyle divorce Tracy if he wasn't willing to be a proper husband and make her happy. Eventually, Kyle apologized to Tracy, and they both agreed to name their baby after Mitch. Meanwhile, inside the prison, the warden and Ed were caught on CCTV witnessing Jim's stabbing. 
which sadly resulted in his death. This unexpected turn surprised them, especially since the weapon used shifted from the hands of white prisoners to a black prisoner named Daryl. This indicated that the two rival gangs were uniting, posing a significant challenge. To address this issue, Ed and his colleague Kareem proposed reinstating a lockdown for all prisoners in their cells. Ed's intention was to exact revenge on all of them for Jim's killing. The prison's head, however, disagreed with the idea of reintroducing the lockdown sentence. Sometime later, a team of eight officers, including Ed, was assigned to transfer Daryl to a regional prison. Daryl was considered highly dangerous, so strict security measures were put in place. His hands were handcuffed, and he was transported using a specialized trolley. Meanwhile, Ian and Kyle, responsible for escorting Daryl's transfer, arrived at the prison. Before proceeding, they had to follow the standard procedure of depositing their pistols and valuables. At the same time, at the women's prison, two detectives were investigating the killing who was carried out by female prisoners, and some of whom were Miriam's students. The detectives noted the absence of signs of resistance on the suspect's bodies. On the other hand, Sam's uncle Jin faced a similar situation. Ultimately, both of them suspected that this case involved more than just a killing because it seemed like a something bad was also involved. They urged Miriam to dig deeper into the motives behind the suspect's determination to kill Sam. On a different note, Ian and Kyle were guided by officers to the room where they were supposed to take over. Curiously, they asked the officer how he managed to differentiate between the many keys for the doors. The officer explained that each key was color-coded for identification. Besides Daryl, who was destined for transfer, the room also held several prisoners assigned to cleaning duties. However, their expressions held a mixture of suspicion and mystery. Notably, Milo was among them. When I and Kyle and the officers let their guard down, a sudden attack erupted from the prisoners in the room. The attackers managed to incapacitate all the guards, including Ian and Kyle. In fact, Kyle was rendered helpless when pepper spray was sprayed into his eyes. As the prisoners attempted to escape, Daryl struggled to find the right key for the door. Milo, sitting nonchalantly, informed him that the key had a blue tag. Soon after, Daryl successfully unlocked the door, allowing the prisoners to seize weapons from the lockers. With these newfound arms, Daryl and the inmates easily overpowered the prison guards. Even the officers in the control room were not spared. Suddenly, the sound of gunshots incited all the prisoners to join the riot. The situation escalated quickly, with thousands of inmates causing chaos. Unfortunately, hundreds of correctional officers became the targets of this outbreak of violence. Meanwhile, Ed, Karim, and numerous other officers geared up to regain control. Daryl's horde of keys allowed the prisoners to infiltrate every room with ease. Even the officers taking refuge in the monitoring room couldn't fend off his onslaught. Daryl then wielded the officers' fear to command them to open all the cell doors in the prison immediately. At that time, the prison swiftly transformed into a battleground, with officers and inmates engaged in a ferocious shootout. Yet the prisoners outnumbered the guards significantly, causing the warden's team to become overwhelmed and ultimately retreat. Soon after, Ed found himself cornered after Daryl responded with pent-up rage he had held onto for a long time. Meanwhile, Ian assisted Kyle in getting up and seeking cover before the hordes of rampaging prisoners could spot them. Simultaneously, two guards stationed in the armory were not spared from the prisoners' attacks. From the watchtower above, Ernie relentlessly fired shots at the convicts. Over in the women's prison section, Miriam was oblivious to the ongoing riot, though it was situated in the same vicinity but a different block. Then Miriam held a meeting with the suspected female prisoner, who was implicated in Sam's death, aiming to delve deeper into her true motives. Miriam had already learned that the female detainee had suffered abuse from her adoptive parents, leading to her teenage pregnancy. In that moment, Miriam's intent was to uncover the truth about whether Sam had genuinely assaulted the female inmate. There, the prisoner responded by claiming that Sam had attempted to do bad things to her, though the facts did not align. Miriam, however, could discern from the prisoner's eyes that she was not telling the truth. On the flip side, Ian and Kyle, trapped in a dire situation, chose to find refuge within an underground pipeline. 
Observing the scene, they noticed some prisoners seeking shelter from others, driven by past grudges that still lingered. Suddenly, an alarm bell sounded in the women's prison, leading to Miriam being urgently taken out of her class to prevent potential problems. The resulting bomb blast was visible from outside the men's prison, causing tremors that reverberated throughout the Kingston area. Meanwhile, the prison riot and Kyle's safety were unknown to Mike, as his hut's location lacked cell phone signal reception. There, Mike expressed that Iris owed him nothing, believing he hadn't truly saved her. In response, Iris expressed her fondness for Mike, highlighting that many had pledged to sacrifice for her, yet he was willing to go even further by taking lives for her sake. Mike then bid Iris farewell, heading into town to tend to his tasks while carrying dinner for them. Iris, however, requested champagne to mark the start of a new phase in her life. As Mike returned to town, his phone was flooded with messages. His shock grew as he tuned into a radio broadcast detailing a prison uprising that had trapped 75 guards inside. At that time, Mike didn't waste a moment. Soon after, he called up Miriam, who was understandably worried about Kyle's situation. Then, a pair of police officers showed up at Miriam's place to verify Kyle's presence. There, Mike advised Miriam to stay tight-lipped about Kyle's whereabouts to ensure his safety. He understood that if news of Kyle's presence in the prison spread, it could pose a danger to him, and relying on the detectives alone wasn't an option due to their lack of authority within the prison walls. Arriving at the prison, Mike was met with a scene bustling with police, firefighters, and journalists covering the unfolding events. Meanwhile, Robert and his team found themselves in a tight spot as they were ordered to follow the state police unit's directions, a command that Robert resisted given his reluctance to operate under their command. Mike then disclosed the critical information to Robert that Kyle and Ian were trapped inside the prison and communication with them was hindered due to jamming signals. Then, armed with this knowledge, Robert swiftly reprimanded his team, instructing them to disable the signal blockers. The trapped detectives needed assistance, and time was of the essence. Soon after, a news helicopter flew low over Kingston Prison to capture the unfolding chaos of what was now the largest riot in history. Unexpectedly, the helicopter came under attack from the prisoners, forcing it to make an emergency landing. Amid the chaos, Ian and Kyle hurriedly sought shelter upon hearing gunshots, which was a sign of prisoners attacking an officer. Fortunately, Kyle's cell phone signal was restored, allowing him to send messages to Mike. In the midst of this, Mike swiftly contacted Robert, urging him to locate Kyle's whereabouts. Robert and his team were then tasked with rescuing both detectives. Simultaneously, the chief of police in Kingston sought Mike's assistance, as the prisoners seemed intent on speaking only to him. They questioned why Mike had been chosen for this negotiation role. Mike openly acknowledged his dual roles as an advocate for convicts and a criminal informant. Hearing that raised the chief of police's curiosity, as they were aware of Mike's diverse background. Fueled by emotion, Mike's patience waned as the higher-ups talked excessively. Surprisingly, the one reaching out to Mike from inside the prison was Carlos. Speaking on behalf of the detainees, Carlos emphasized that their actions weren't just a riot cause they saw it as a revolution. Despite this, Mike still labeled it a riot. Then he conveyed to Carlos that unless the prisoners surrendered, 50 snipers would be positioned on the prison walls and the National Guard would deploy armored combat vehicles. Yet, Carlos had a surprise in store for Mike and the authorities. Suddenly, he pointed them to a page. To their astonishment, they found several officers, including Ed and Kareem, held hostage and concealed under cloth. These were officers despised by the prisoners. Carlos then conveyed a message that prison officials had taken away more than just the inmates' time and freedom. Now, the prisoners were determined to reclaim what they had lost. Though Mike couldn't see Carlos, he could infer that Carlos was reading from a prepared text. This indicated that he wasn't the mastermind behind the riot. Soon after, Mike swiftly asked Carlos to connect him with the true leaders of the uprising to determine if they were within or beyond the prison walls. He proposed a meeting at the Red Carriage restaurant, but Carlos insisted Mike come directly to the prison yard.
However, the authorities denied Mike direct access, leading to a shocking outcome that they shot one of the officers held hostage. Dumbfounded, Mike struggled to process the scene and opted to step outside for a smoke to calm his nerves. Meanwhile, the SWAT team began their infiltration of the prison through the sewer tunnel, aiming to rescue Kyle and Ian. Conversely, Mike filled in the chief of police that thousands of prisoners desired revenge, and that was the driving force behind their actions. Meanwhile, Milo realized that the riot couldn't continue for long, prompting him to don a civil servant uniform for disguise. On the other hand, Ian was attempting to soothe a frightened Kyle, who was struggling to catch his breath due to fear. Suddenly, the prisoners who had feigned hiding appeared, but Robert and his team managed to swiftly eliminate them, rescuing Ian and Kyle from danger. Elsewhere, Iris got startled again, and this time by the sight of a bear approaching. Little did she know, the bear was just searching for the food Mike usually provided. At the same time, Stevie and his crew were investigating a house that had been surrounded by the SWAT team earlier. Among the evidence found was a cell phone linked to one of the suspects. The cell phone's recent call had been directed to Mike. However, Stevie promptly disposed of the cell phone by submerging it in a bathtub filled with acid. Later on, the National Guard arrived at the prison in their armored vehicles, taking charge of the situation. Soon after, hundreds of these armed forces ascended fire ladders, encircling the prison from atop the walls. At that time, Mike found himself in a crucial role cause he had to convince the thousands of prisoners to cease their rioting. Failure on Mike's part would result in the National Guard soldiers opening fire on all the prisoners. Meanwhile, Robert managed to incapacitate an inmate who was sharpening a dangerous weapon while searching for an escape route in the prison. At the same time, disguised as an observer, Milo observed the National Guard troops taking positions atop the prison wall. On the other hand, Mike confidently entered the prison, assuming the role of a negotiator representing the government and law enforcement. Back at home, Miriam and Tracy were astonished as they watched live media coverage showing Mike entering the prison. Worried, Miriam rushed back to the prison. Meanwhile, within the prison walls, Mike came to the realization that Daryl, his former prison mate, was the leader of the uprising. On the other hand, up on the tower, a Marine advised Ernie to descend due to the situation being out of control. However, he refused, determined to maintain his post. This decision resulted in a physical confrontation between Ernie and the Marines. Shortly after, Daryl shared with Mike that the prisoner's sole motivation was revenge. He explained that his own conviction was related to an attempted of killing, but the prison officials' unfair treatment and the unfulfilled promise surrounding Kenny's death pushed him to a breaking point. Afterward, Daryl expressed a desire for the world to be aware of the inhumane conditions they endured. Sadly, Mike's efforts to persuade them to halt the action proved fruitless, as Daryl ultimately shot Ed. This chaos making the National Guard firing numerous bullets, resulting in the death of many prisoners in the open area. At the same time, the SWAT team followed suit, taking down prisoners that they perceived as obstructing their path. At that time, Mike chose to lie low and seek shelter. Shortly thereafter, Carlos emerged from a room only to be shocked by the chaotic scene and was subsequently shot. Unexpectedly, Ernie retaliated against the Marines who had assaulted him, but he met his demise at the hands of the National Guard. Among the vast number of prisoners, only a small fraction managed to survive, and only one Milo escaped by donning the warden's uniform. Despite feeling like he couldn't successfully be a peace negotiator, Mike felt a deep sense of relief knowing that Kyle was safe. Fortunately, Karim also survived the attack orchestrated by the prisoners. At that moment, Miriam was filled with gratitude witnessing Mike and Kyle come out alive from the most devastating tragedy. The series coming to an end as Mike returns to his cottage, holding the champagne that Iris had requested. Tears welled up as Iris, holding a knife, expressed that there was something taken from her that she could never regain. Despite the hardships, she yearned to rekindle her spirit. And so, the film comes to an end. The moral lesson from this film is in the craziest of situations, don't forget to check your cell phone signal. It might just save the day.